Okay, welcome to everybody. Um, the weather was decent, that's good. Nobody had to risk their lives getting here. And so what I want to talk about tonight is what Tim, we're going to talk about our connection between our mind and our body. Because as Tim said, for 400 years we have separated those two. So if you go to the psychiatrist, he asks you about your thoughts and your brain. Probably never asked you about your bowel habits or anything. You go to the GI doc and he asks about your bowel habits, but he probably never asks about your mental health. Yet they're intimately connected. And so we're going to run through that tonight. But first, I always like to start with an experiential experience for everybody. So I want everybody to get comfortable in your chair, both feet on the ground, good posture, sitting upright. And what I'm going to do is we're going to do some deep breathing exercises where basically I want you to take a breath in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth, with the in-breath half as long as the out-breath. And as we do that, I want you to close your eyes, and I'm going to work with these crystal bowls. And they're going to emit a sound that's going to be very relaxing. But the other thing I want you to do is set an intention for tonight. And what I mean by an intention is, what is something that you want to get out of this evening's event? It could be learning to relax. It could be anything that you want. But it's really important to set an intention. So I want you to do that. And we're going to spend a few minutes just breathing, relaxing, and listening to the crystal singing balls. imagination. Visualize somewhere you'd rather be than here. Breathe in, breathe out, deeply and fully. Okay, so if I go to the doctor in our Western model, what do I get to relax me? I get a Xanax. In the integrative model, this is what I do. I teach people how to breathe deeply, how to listen to relaxing tones, and guess what? It works just as good as a Xanax. So you all now have been medicated, <laughs> and now we can proceed. Because when you're relaxed, your mind is a much more open state of learning and retaining information than when you're stressed. Did anybody see the movie Uncut Gems? Nobody. Adam Sandler's new movie. It was the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I walked out, and I've never walked out of a movie. 
because it was nothing but screaming and yelling and chaos for two hours. And it was just the opposite of relaxing. You went out of that movie kind of drenched in sweat because you were so uptight. So my advice, don't go see the movie. Anyway, so this is, anybody know where this is? This is Patagonia, South America. So this is the famous park, Torres del Paine. And the reason I put this up is because when you look at that image, it immediately evokes this sense of awe and wonder. At least it does to me, because I love being outside. And I hiked in this park, and I hiked up to these towers. No, I did not climb the towers. Um, I'm not that adventuresome. But it was a wonderful experience. 500 million acres, and there were probably 300 people in that whole park. It's amazing. So it was really cool. Is it true that there's Patagonian giants? Pat, ooh, I don't know. I don't know anything about giants. <laughs> These towers are giant. They're almost 3,000 feet. Anyway, the mind-body connection, how the power of our thoughts and beliefs affect our physical and mental health. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to kind of take you through a journey from a cell through the universe and make you realize how what you believe and how you think profoundly affect your mental and physical health. So our current belief is that we're frail biochemical sh machines with our destiny controlled by our genes. We are enamored with the genome. Why? Because we've learned how to take it out of a cell, dissect it, and tell people, you're going to get this disease. But there's a problem with that theory. We are actually powerful creators and masters of our lives. We are able to create lives of beauty, peace, happiness, health, and love. We have a choice. Our genes do not determine our destiny. Less than 2% of all diseases that we see in this country are genetically determined. Think cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, thalassemia, almost every other disease and almost all chronic disease. You may have a genetic predisposition, but it does not predetermine you to that disease. It's the environment. So we are not subservient to our genes. We live in a world filled with hate, chaos, and we need this more than ever right now, both for ourselves and the world, of how do we get to peace, happiness, love, and contentment? Because most of us are not content. Most of us are not happy. And we try and achieve those things with means outside of ourselves. If you really look at happiness, there's an uh, author and scientist out at Harvard. His name is Sean Anker. 95% of happiness is within. Happiness comes from within does not come from external sources. So how do we achieve that? Well, let's look at the cell. Every cell in the human body is a microcosm of us. Every cell has a respiratory system, a cardiovascular system, an endocrine system, and a primitive immune system, a nervous system. So I can look at the cell as a microcosm of myself. Our current belief is the DNA in the nucleus controls the functioning of the cell. That's the theory behind, well, you're going to get diabetes because your sister had it, your mother had it, and your great-grandfather had it. Not necessarily so. The new reality is that cells, through this covering around the cells called the cell membrane, actively analyze thousands of stimuli from the environment, and those stimuli either tell genes to be turned on or turned off. It's the environment. It's the environment. So the actual brain of the cell is the cell membrane because it senses what's going around, around us and it tells genes to come on or come off. Stephen Cole, he is a psychologist out at UCLA. He's a research psychologist and he says the cell is nothing more than a machine that takes environmental stimuli and turns it into biology. And he's probably right. So the current belief is if a cell is ailing, then there's something wrong with the cell. There's something inherently wrong with how that cell functions. But the new reality is if a cell is ailing, 
you have to look at the environment. So let's, microbiologists have known this for decades, cell biologists have known this for decades. If I take a cell and I want to make it thrive and grow, I have to find the right environment, which might be nutrients in culture, it might be temperature, it might be light or dark. So if I have an alien cell, I change the cell culture. I add amino acids, I add vitamins, I change the temperature, whatever it might be. We've looked at if, if our cells are alien, something's wrong with the cell and we've got to fix it. But it's just not true. Environmental influences, including nutrition, stress, emotions, thoughts, and beliefs, can modify how genes are expressed through a new science called epigenetics. Epigenetics means above the gene. So we know that the genetic code, this DNA, is coded in proteins, okay? Proteins surround the DNA. And those proteins then respond to environmental signals that turn genes on or turn genes off. So let's look at these fuzzy little creatures here. They're not there for fun. Two rabbits, genetically identical. They have the same genes, genetically identical, but they look different. This one's got black paws, ears, and a nose. That one's white. This one was raised at 20 degrees centigrade. That one was raised at 30 degrees centigrade. The thermal environment was different so it stimulated different genes to be turned on or turned off. It's the environment, the thermal environment. Look at these two mice over here. One is yellow, fat, and doesn't look so good, and the other one looks like a normal brown mouse. They are genetically identical. They have a genetic defect called an MTFR defect, which folic acid, which is a vitamin, essential vitamin, is not processed right. The fat yellow one was not given folic acid. The other one was given folic acid. A chemical signal change in genetically identical mice changes their pattern of development and their disease state. So that big yellow one is diabetic. The other one isn't. It's the environment. It's the environment. So what happens? Well, we think that that cell membrane, we always thought that it was this thin layer and it allowed molecules in and allowed molecules out like sodium and potassium and chloride and bicarbonate and all these different things. Well, the reality is it's actually a mechanism which the cell and body translates environmental signals into function. So cell membranes are these very thin membranes and there's these fat molecules and there's these protein receptors with, embedded within that cell membrane. And those protein receptors, of which there's thousands in every cell, constantly sense the environment for signals to make proteins and signal the DNA to do something. So a chemical binds to that protein, or a chemical binds to that receptor, and they're very specific, okay? Insulin receptors only bind insulin. And when it does, it translates a protein into the cell. A protein is made, and that protein then goes to the DNA and acts on the DNA to turn something on or turn something off. It's all about the environment. So these signals can be chemical, they can be thermal, they can be sound. That sound actually changed something in your body. Now, it might be imperceptible. You're not going to say, oh, I grew a third arm or something. <laughs> but there are changes, and we are able to measure that now. Yeah. So two types of receptor or proteins. There's Receptor proteins that interact with these molecules that are floating around in energy. And then there's effector proteins, which are the proteins produced within the cell that affect genetic expression. Our current belief is that we live in a Newtonian world. So this is the little physics part here. Newton was a genius, brilliant. We have all these laws of thermodynamics and all of this stuff. And his physical universe was very linear, very linear. And that's the world that we live in right now. So if I have a chemical reaction and it's not working right, and <coughs> let's say A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D, and something's wrong with C, what do I do? I give you a drug to fix C. Well, it's not that simple. That's why most drugs don't work very well. We live in a quantum universe where everything in our environment affects everything else. It's just not as simple as this linear model of Newton. 
Cells can are, have this interwoven complex, this very highly complex interaction between environment, proteins, and all these signals that come in. The quantum perspective reveals that the universe is an integration of independent energy fields. We are all energy. Our cells vibrate at different frequencies. Yeah. One of the theories in quantum physics is called entanglement. And entanglement says that every action that every being takes affects everything in the universe. It's very hard to comprehend. Even thoughts can be put out into the universe and affect things distantly. So when they, they've looked at uh, identical twins, studies on identical twins, and they held, they've had instances where the twins have been separated for thousands of miles, and one twin will break, let's say, break a leg, the other twin feels it. That's entanglement. We are all one. Human, animal, plants. So when we're sick, which we are as a society, we're sick, our earth is sick. It's not different. This isn't coincidence that we have climate change and we have a sick earth and we have a sick agricultural system, we have a sick human system. We are all interconnected. So the Newtonian flow of information is very linear. If I give a drug B, then it should correct C. Doesn't work that way. We have intercommunication and crosstalk between all these different things in our cells. So that's a protein map of a fruit fly. So if I change one protein, what happens? It changes multiple proteins and reactions within that cell. And here's the thing about biologic systems. They're very redundant. So if I have, let's say, a serotonin receptor in my brain, and we treat depression by giving stuff that makes more serotonin, well, I have serotonin receptors everywhere in my body. So when I give a drug to change my serotonin levels in my brain, what do we call the other effects? Side effects. So I affect the receptor everywhere in my body and I get what are called side effects. Well, they're not really side effects, they're effects of the drug. They're just in a spot where we don't want them. So you read on TV, right, how great that drug is and then what do they list? The 42 side effects. And you're like, whoa, I don't want to take that. That drug's gonna kill me. Yeah, those are effects. So the physical body can be affected by immaterial mind. Your thoughts profoundly affect your disease state and whether you're well or sick. So thoughts directly influence the physical brain, uh, the physical brain control our physiology. So it's really, really important. And this is hard to do in today's world. But we have to shift our mind's energy towards positive life-generating thoughts and get rid of the always present draining, debilitating, negative thoughts. And we are bombarded with that on a daily basis. There are really great things going on in the world, believe it or not. All is not doom and gloom. Be careful of your thoughts. If you really pay attention when you interact with someone, they don't even have to say something and you know what, you can almost predict what they're thinking. If you really pay attention. The energy of your thoughts can travel through the universe. So let me give you an example. A year ago, I lost my cell phone. Disaster, right? My life is over. I might as well just go jump off a bridge. No, it wasn't that bad. So I go to my computer because I want to discontinue my cell phone coverage. Go to my computer, go into Verizon, and this is how you do it. And then they say, well, I have two-level authentication. So they want to send me a text to make sure it's me. I don't have a phone. Well, now i got to call a phone number. Anybody ever try to call a cell company before? Fortunately, I hadn't. So I could look at it two ways. I could look at it as, this is going to be the worst experience in my life. It's going to take forever, and I probably won't even get it fixed. Or I can look at it as, I'm going to meet a new person on the phone, and he's going to, he or she is going to be able to help me. So that's what I went in with my mindset. Called up Verizon, got Nathan. Now, I was curious where I'm talking to people from, from Tampa, Florida. You know, it's 10 below zero here. It's 80 in Tampa. And I s explained my situation to Nathan. Five minutes later, problem solved. I'm off the phone. 
So I truly believe, and there's science behind this, that what you put out into the universe is what you get back. So think, I always think of airports. People are stressed, right? They're going, you don't know why they're in the airport, they're on a plane, you don't know why they're on a plane, they might be going to a funeral, they might be going to Disney World, they might be going to the biggest business meeting they've ever been to, who knows? Flight's canceled. So what do you do? You go up to the service agents and start screaming at them. Well, if that's the energy you're giving out, guess what you're gonna get back? The same thing. That person is gonna have no impetus whatsoever to help you. It's like, here you go, we have a flight tomorrow night at midnight, you'll get it at six the next day, see ya. But if you go to that service agent and say, you know, I know you're gonna be able to help me with this problem, my flight was canceled, you're empathetic, you have a positive attitude, guess what that service agent is gonna give you back? The same thing. You're going to get what you express. So if you express anger, frustration, hostility, what do you expect to get back? Same thing. Same thing. Now, the question becomes, can the mere thinking of positive thoughts impact or change our lives at all? And maybe, maybe not, because we have two subdivisions to our brain. We have the conscious subdivision, which is the thinking part. It's the rational reasoning part of our brain. And then we have the subconscious part of our brain, which is the stimulus response. The subconscious part of our brain is, like it says, it's below consciousness. We don't realize that it's going on. And many times we don't realize our behavior is because of pre-programming of that subconscious. And the thing is, 95% of our behavior is controlled by our subconscious brain. That can be a real problem because our subconscious brain is pre-programmed for the most part by age seven. So your subconscious was programmed by your parents, your grandparents, all your relatives, your teachers, your family, your community, your church, whatever it was. So the question then becomes, can I reprogram my subconscious? Because if 95% of our behavior is stimulus response, I might be in trouble. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. When I was a kid, if I spilled a milk or something, my mom got really angry with me. I mean, the belt came out. Pew. So I had kids. Guess what happened when they spilled? I got really angry. And I've like thought about that when I began studying this. I thought about that and I'm like, why? That reaction makes no sense for what happened. So I changed it through meditation. So our subconscious beliefs, our subconscious thought patterns can change. Had a great example of that last night. A friend of my wife's, she was out to dinner with some girlfriends. She was divorced three years ago. Her ex-husband walks in the restaurant. She hadn't seen him in three years. She was still hanging on that they were gonna get back together. Walks into the restaurant with his new wife. She immediately throws up over the whole table. Yeah. The power of our mind is incredible. It's incredible. So this is my grandnephew, Hughes. He'll be one years old in March. And Hughes' parents don't know it or didn't know it at the time he was born, but they're genetic engineers and computer programmers. Because Hughes can be raised in an environment of warmth, love, care, safety, protection, and he'll turn out to be one human with less disease and more of a chance of having a great life compared to if he's raised in an environment of hostility, feelings of abandonment, anger, hate. He'll be a completely different person. And if he's raised in that latter environment, he will have increased risk for all kinds of chronic disease, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, Obesity, all linked to how he was treated as a child. And when you think about one third of households with kids, there's spousal abuse. And so when kids witness spousal abuse, it's PTSD. And they are set up for chronic problems, both psychological as well as physical. It is so important that we treat our kids so well. 
And little things can have huge impacts on subconscious programming. And I'll give you an example of myself. My daughter comes home and she's got all A's and one B. I should just say, that's spectacular, but nope, what does dad say? Why'd you get a B? So what did that tell her subconscious? I'm not good enough. Yeah. Words are so important. They're incredibly important, particularly with kids, because you're programming these kids for life. And when you're programming their beliefs and their subconscious programming, you're also programming their genetics by a phenomenon called epigenetics. Environment turns genes on and turns genes off. So we're not only, bi we're not only computer programs, we're genetic engineers as parents. Kind of scary, isn't it? Kind of scary. But we can change our subconscious because we have the ability to be self-reflective. We think we're the only animal species that can do that. So when a lion's out on the Serengeti and there's a gazelle right there, that lion isn't thinking, hmm, I think I'll leave that one alone today. No, it's a stimulus response. It's a subconscious programming. Gazelle, food, boom. But we can reflect on what we're doing. So I was able to reflect on my reaction to spilled beverages. And my reflection was, that's a ridiculous reaction. I need to change that. My wife was pre-programmed for red lights. She can't stand sitting at a red light. Guess what? Her dad can't either. She's pre-programmed. That's a stimulus response that's subconscious she doesn't even think about. Now, she's changed that. But that's what I'm talking about. Do you have the same problem? <laughs> I don't have a wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you want to see if we could find you one? Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. It's good to have wives. I love having a wife, yeah. you know? Even after the fourth time, it has worked out okay. I'm just kidding. Um, so disempowering programs in our subconscious can be rewritten by techniques such as hypnosis. That's the way hypnosis works. It really is working at our subconscious level to bring out something that's causing us bad behavior. It can be done with positive repetitive affirmations, particularly in conjunction with meditation. And then there's something that is referred to as energy psychology, which is cognitive behavioral therapy connected with meditative practices. So we can reprogram these disempowering subconscious beliefs. So once we understand the possibility and practicality of changing our subconscious, we're not trapped in this bad belief system. We're free. We're free. Isn't that the goal in life is to feel free? Spiritual freedom. Spiritual freedom. Yeah. It's cool. So we can change our perceptions, our belief. We can create new mindsets and behavior to be whatever we want our life to be. Now, there is a rub in all of this, though. Our brains, from an evolutionary standpoint, are programmed to take negative thoughts and negative experiences and trap them like Velcro. Because there was a survival advantage. When I was a hunter-gatherer and I was out on the wilderness and my the tiger ate Uncle Joe, I better remember that or I'm going to be next. That really is gone in today's society. There are very few things in our society that are truly life-threatening on an everyday basis. And the other thing is positive experiences and thoughts kind of slide off like Teflon. So we have to reinforce those all the time. And that's what these mind-body practices do. We'll talk about meditation, but they reinforce these. That's why we have to practice them. So for example, today I was walking and a car was coming from school and there was this little girl, probably seven years old, and she's got her head sticking out the back window, you know, like how dogs like to feel the breeze, and she's just smiling and laughing. And I stopped my walk, and I looked at her, and I waved, and I just sat there for a minute, thinking about the pure joy this kid was expressing. So I turned that little positive thing into a positive experience and incorporated that in my brain. It made me feel good. It, may, it gave me a boost of serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. 
But we don't pay attention to little things like that. I think most people would just walk by and, hey, well, there's a kid hanging out the window. I hope she doesn't fall out the car. <laughs> so incorporate those little positive things into a positive experience. Kids are the best because they're usually happy, they're carefree, and they live really well most of the time. So incorporate positive experiences. Current belief is that chemicals in our bodies control our thoughts and emotions. Fix a chemical deficiency and you fix the thought or emotion. Psychopharmacology. Well, I'm here to tell you it doesn't work very well. It does not work. We give psychoactive drugs like they're Skittles. Oh, feeling anxious? Here's a Xanax. Oh, feeling a little down and out? Here's an antidepressant. Oh, hearing voices? Here's your Thorazine, your psychotic med. And they all have tremendous side effects. Tremendous side effects. So the new reality is, though, our thoughts and emotions form a two-way interplay between our body and brain, either maintaining health or undermining it. So let's look at depression. People with depression have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, dementia, cancer. And let's look at the flip side of that coin. People with all those diseases have an increased risk of depression. It's not coincidence. It's not coincidence. Every change in the physiologic state is accompanied by an appropriate, and I have lost the bottom of the script here, appropriate change in the psychologic state. Elmer Green from the Mayo Clinic. So it's not as simple as fixing a biochemical reaction. Antidepressants, frankly, don't work long term. So we have this theory that there's not enough serotonin in our brain, so we get depressed. The thing is, 95% of our serotonin is produced by our gut. So we give a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, we get more serotonin, we think that depression is going to get better. It might in the acute phase, but they, in the long term, it doesn't work that way. Because depression is a multifactorial problem. It's a multifactorial problem. So would you suggest diet? You want to know what the best thing for mild to moderate depression is? Exercise in nature. My prescription, if I have somebody mildly depressed, you go out every morning and you walk east facing the sun for 45 minutes. It's as good, if not better, than an antidepressant. And guess what? It doesn't have the side effects. Antidepressants have tremendous side effects. So for men, sexual libido is depressed. For women, weight gain. Those are the two things that concern people. So they have tremendous side effects. Walking in nature in the sunshine has no side effects whatsoever. And the other thing, it's free. It's free. So we've all heard of the placebo effect. So the placebo effect is a physiologic effect that you get when I give you a pill that has no biologic activity. I give you a sugar pill, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, boy, I feel better. My sister-in-law did that to me this winter. She had a respiratory illness. I said, 99% of them are viral. Don't worry about it. Oh, I need a Z-Pak. I said, no, I'm not prescribing you a Z-Pak. So she found somebody to prescribe her a Z-Pak. And she got the Z-Pak, and she took the pill. She, she, she goes, oh, I felt better instantly. Placebo. If I gave her a sugar pill, she would have felt better instantly. Placebo. It's powerful. We think that 40 to 60% of the action of almost all drugs is placebo, particularly the psychotropic drugs. Placebo. It's the power of belief. I had a cancer patient come in for an integrative medicine consult, and his physician had given him a new drug called Keytruda. You've probably all seen it on TV. It cures everything. And it didn't work. Cancer grew right through it. And he told me, he goes, I knew it wouldn't work. You know, I only had a 1% chance. I knew it wouldn't work. Guaranteed it wasn't going to work. Now, if he'd gone in with the attitude that, you know, there's this powerful new drug and I know it's going to work, it probably would have worked. In fact, there's a very famous case report. There was a guy who had a tumor called a sarcoma, and a sarcoma is an awful tumor. We have really no way to stop him. But there was a new drug that was on the market, and that drug had really good results in a small number of people. So his doctor gave it to him. He said, you know what, this drug has really worked well. Six weeks later, no sign of cancer. Another report came out a few months later that 
you know, the data isn't so good. People are now dying from this. He was dead in three weeks. Wow. Belief. Belief. Now, am I saying that this is the cure to all disease? Absolutely not. But it's part of the process of he health and healing, whether you're healing from a heart attack or healing from cancer or whatever. If you have the belief that whatever you're having done, so my dad, <coughs> he's 90 years old. When he was 85, he had colon cancer. Doc says you need six months of chemotherapy. Great, we're going to just go have chemotherapy. So I call him up and I say, hey, Dad, how are you doing? Great, doing great. I said, don't you dread going to chemo? Nope. One last time I have to go, and I know that, those, that chemotherapy is killing these cells and I'm going to be fine. 90 years old, no sign of cancer. He believed that, truly believed it. So it's part of the equation. It's not the cure-all, it's part of the equation. If you don't have the belief in what your doctor's doing for you, you're probably not going to do well. 2002, Irving Kirsch wrote an article called The Emperor's New Drugs, an analysis of antidepressant medication data submitted to the Food and Drug Administration. And in order to write this paper, he actually had to sue the FDA to get the data because the F there's so much negative data on antidepressants that's never published. Huge problem in our medical literature. We don't publish negative results. Anyway, he looked at all the data and he came to the conclusion that 80% of the response to antidepressants was placebo. Could be duplicated by giving you a simple sugar pill. And here's the funny thing, he did a follow-up article and over time, they got better. Why? Because the drug companies advertised them more on TV and told everybody how well they worked. So we reinforced the placebo effect by the belief that these drugs were getting better because that's what we were told on the television set. 2002, same year of a surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon down in uh, Dallas at Baylor, wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. And he took 180 people and he was going to do arthroscopic surgery on the knee. They all had degenerative joint disease of the knee. And he was going to put in three arthroscopic ports, these little uh, metal tubes we put in there with scopes and surgical instruments. And in the first group, he shaved the meniscus. So menisca are these C-shaped cartilages that go between the femur and the tibia and allow our joints to work seamlessly. And so the first group, he shaved the meniscus and washed out the joint. The second group, he put the ports in, didn't shave the meniscus, just washed out the joint. Third group, he put the ports in and did nothing. Six months later, looked at their pain scores. They were identical. Made no difference whether he shaved the meniscus or not. The power that these people believed that surgeon knew what he was doing and fixed their knee was just as powerful as if he did it. Yeah. Cool stuff. So biologic life is all about information exchange. We're an intelligent system and it involves massive exchange of information between our environment and us. And us. And that's everything. That's the energy generated by humans. It's the energy in this room. It's the sunshine. It's the plants. It's everything. It's everything. So our current belief is chronic illnesses such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, is attacking our body and we're just helpless victims and the only way we're going to get better is to go to the healthcare system. The new reality is through conscious intervention, through intervention of our thoughts and beliefs, we can play an active role in our health and wellness. We can play an active role in our recovery. We can play an active role of whether we survive a treatment or don't. So a gentleman came up to me before and he says, you know, I just diagnosed with cancer and I want to do some kind of alternative therapy. I said, you know, I want you to really think about this because the data would tell us that what we're doing in the world of cancer is the best we know how to do. But what you can do for yourself is believe in whatever treatment you're doing and help yourself by getting the mindset of I will get through this and be okay. So when I talk to a cancer patient, everybody wants to know, oh, how long am I going to live, doc? I say, I have no idea, which is a true statement. I have no idea how long any individual is going to live. But then I ask them, I say, tell me what you think your life will be like in four years or five years. And they're like, what do you mean? I'll be dead. 
No, I want you to tell me where you want to be and what you want to be doing in five years. And you get them thinking about that. And all of a sudden, you've kind of changed how they believe. If you tell a patient you're going to die in six months, guess when they're going to die? Six months. If you let a patient visualize their life in five years, you've given them a huge impetus to say, oh, yeah, I could be doing this. We think of patients who say, I just want to make it to my grandson's wedding. And they make it to their grandson's wedding, and then what happens? They die. So we really want to put that timeline out there for them to believe that they can do it. And you know what? I don't consider that false hope because I think anybody can do anything. We have cancer patients that, that you know, we say, oh, you're going to die in six months. And six years later, they're alive. Why is that? What we do in our medical world is we discount it. Oh, that's an outlier. Let's not worry about that. When in reality, we should study everything that person did, including how they be believed and thought. So I talked about this in my earlier talk. There's a movie I watched last week. It's called The Farewell. And it's in Chinese with subtitles. And the premise is there's an older, elderly Chinese woman who's diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Ma brain mats, whatever. The doctor says to her family she has six months to live. Well, in Chinese culture, they don't tell. If they have a diagnosis, they don't tell the person that because they don't want to upset them. So the whole family knows about this, and the whole family gathers under the disguise of a wedding to see Grandma one last time. And she's wondering what's going on. You know, she wondered, well, what did, my la what did my CAT scan results show? Oh, and her sister says, oh, it just showed a benign spot on your lung. Well, why do I have this cough? Oh, it's just you're cold. So she has no idea she has stage four lung cancer. Six years later, she's still with us. I think we do a lot of disservice to people by telling them, you're going to die. And then the reality is, mortality statistics in cancer or anything else are based on huge populations. Everybody's different. I have no idea when you're going to die. I have no idea when, why, or where. And that's the reality. So we have to give people, we call it hope, I guess. We call it hope. Faith. Faith. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know? It's very powerful. And one of the things that a cancer diagnosis does is it, the amount of stress it generates is really astronomical. And uh, I shouldn't probably say this, but I'm going to. Particularly women, we make women worry about cancer all the time. And I think we do a huge disservice. Even the, and I haven't proven this, and there's no papers to prove it, but based on what I'm learning about this mind-body connection, even the worrying can increase someone's risk of a disease. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. For example, my sister-in-law, she knows she's going to get cancer. Like, she goes, I have cancer in my body. I said, you know what, you're probably right. But we have this great thing called an immune system that attacks those and gets rid of them. But when you're worrying and stressed all the time, your immune system doesn't work right. And so we have a patient who has cancer, and there's the emotional stress of cancer, there's the physical stress of cancer, there's the financial stress of cancer. And I can tell you, stress is not good for health. And so what we're trying to do at our cancer center is we're trying to integrate some of these complementary therapies. So we're going to start a course on mindfulness-based stress reduction for pa patients and their caregivers. We teach people meditation. We teach people guided imagery. Because when you can reduce the stress, you can improve their healing and wellness. Yeah. So stress, the silent killer. Here we are. Here we are. Our bodies, one, the first thing we learn in integrative medicine is that our bodies want to naturally be well, and to get to that state of wellness, we have to give it the appropriate environment to thrive. So there we are. Homeostasis. It's a complex dynamic equilibrium resulting in wellness of the or organism. We want to be in a state of homeostasis, wellness. That's our default. Disease is not. <coughs> Stress is a state of mental or emotional strain which occurs when homeostasis is threatened 
or perceived to be so. And I highlight perceived to be so because in our society, most stress is perceived. It's not real. It's not real. I'll give you an example. People are afraid to fly. Oh, I'm not getting on an airplane. That thing's going to crash. If you look at the statistics, 2016, 40 million airplane flights took off and landed. Ten of them crashed. That means your risk of dying in an airplane was 0.000025%. There's no basis for being afraid to get on an airplane. You are much more likely to die walking out the door for healthy for life and getting in your car. But why do we think we're going to die in airplanes? Because that's all the news reports. You think planes are falling out of the sky. They don't report 10,000 flights landed safely today and everybody made it home. Nope. That's the warped perspective we get from news, and we'll talk about news later. But most stress is perceived because we have this preconceived notion. My boss called me into the office. Shit, I'm going to get fired. No. He wanted to compliment you on the great job you did. I mean, we're programmed to think negative, and it causes this tremendous biochemical problem in our body. So we need some stress in our lives or we die. Without stress, we literally would die. Our adrenal glands would shrivel up and we'd collapse. So stress is inevitable. Stress is part of everyday life. People say, well, is there good or bad? There's not good or bad. It's how you handle stress that's most important. So when you use stress as a motivator, like, oh, I got my boards coming up. Better study. That's good, quote, good stress. It stimulates you to do something to make yourself better. But then there's bad stress which I said well, I'm not going to label, or there's allostasis or cachyostasis. That's when stress is so great that it debilitates our ability to live a normal life. We're, we feel like the mountain is falling on us. That's when people get disease. And think about the word disease. If you break the word disease into two parts, dis-ease. So when we are at ease with ourselves in our life, we're not at dis-ease and we're well. When we are not at ease with our life, we're at dis-ease and that leads to the physiologic disease. Very interesting to think about that word. Stress. So the stress response as it was developed in our bodies was meant to be acute run away from something that was going to threaten our life and be done with it in 10 minutes. But today, we're bombarded with stress. We worry about things all the time. Worry about things we should never have to worry about. I'll talk about the news. I tell people to turn off the news because there's nothing on the news that you can do anything about. Worry about the things that you can actually influence. And you know what that comes down to? One thing, you. How do you respond? How do you act? That's the only thing you can change. You can't change the person next to you. You can only change how you react and respond to any given situation. That's it. Stress about that if you want. The stress response affects many organ systems, okay? When we're in chronic stress, we produce more glucose. Glucose leads to diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, and all this other stuff. Stress has a direct physiological relationship with disease states. We underestimate the impact of stress. So if somebody has a heart attack, we send them home with their statin to lower their cholesterol. God forbid they have too much cholesterol. Sarcasm. Um, we send them home with a blood pressure medicine, a blood thinner like an aspirin. We send them maybe home with an antidepressant because they're bummed out, their heart isn't working. And we ignore the stress in their life which is a bigger, as big a risk factor as smoking and diabetes. Yet we do nothing about it. And we wonder why our results aren't very good. Yeah. Stress response sunts blood away from non-essential organs. So think of when you're anxious, you don't eat. Your guts can turmoil. That's because we've shunted blood away from it. It ain't working. Reproductive system, when people are stressed, we, get, we shunt blood away from the reproductive system. 
So we have women, our infertility rate is the highest it's ever, I just read this yesterday, our infertility rate in this country is as high as it's ever been. Why? Eggs aren't working, sperm aren't working. Why is that? My theory, because we're under this tremendous stress. And so a woman goes to the fertility doctor because she wants to get pregnant, and all of a sudden it's this, you know, reproduction should be fun, right? Should be a blast. But now we've made it a chore. Got to have sex every 10 minutes. Got to take all these drugs. Got to take your temperature every 30 seconds. And now these women are stressed to the max. Do you think they're going to get pregnant? No. So you've heard, everybody's heard this story before. Infertility, can't get pregnant, adopt a kid, six months later they're pregnant, right? We've taken the stress of trying to conceive a child away, and voila. That's a theory. I can't prove it. But I'm pretty confident in it. Stress is particularly detrimental to kids. Okay? It can affect their development. It can affect their growth. It can affect their body composition. So, for example, kids under tremendous stress because of social things, you know, they don't have enough, their food insecure, their housing insecure, their safety insecure. These are the kids with all of the health problems. Tremendous, tremendously, profoundly effective on kids. Magnified when you're a kid. Stress shunts blood away from our thinking brain. When you're under stress, you don't think well. You don't reason well. You don't remember well. You're less creative. So if you want to foster the best of your employees, have the best environment possible. Be a really nice boss. When you're an ass, your employees are like this. They're fight or flight all the time. Do you think they're going to be productive and creative? Not a chance. Look at Silicon Valley. Look at what Google does or Apple. They have play areas. They play ping pong. They have food brought in. Not that it's not stressful. I mean, they're working hard, but they live in an environment that's actually conducive to creativity, and they're very creative. Hospital, probably the worst place in the world to work because of the stress. Herbert Benson from Harvard, a physician out at Harvard, has said 90% of all doctor's office visits are stress-related in one way or another. Acute stress, chronic stress. It's all there, chronic disease, stress. Fear, fear kills because it leads to stress. Jack Canfield, he wrote a book, I think, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. Think about that. Think about that. Kids are happy and playful because they're fearless. We've been conditioned to be afraid of everything. Afraid I don't have enough money. Afraid my wife doesn't love me. Afraid I'm too thin. Afraid I'm too fat. Afraid I'm not smart enough. We're besieged by fear. We practically are sh fearful of our own shadow. And this is how bad it is. I had a technologist who worked with me in the interventional radiology suite. And she got on her phone, you know, you get these KCCI alerts, you know, I mean, why people get that, I have no idea. Sorry if I offended you. Um, and Waukee High School was shut down because there was a gun in the school. And she is freaking out because she's worried her two and three-year-olds are going to go to Waukee High someday, and now she's worried they're going to get shot. Yeah. Yeah. So she lives in this constant world of fear. Remember when we were all kids? You're all old enough. We went out to play at 7 in the morning. We didn't show back up till the sun was going down. We were all over the place. How many kids do that nowadays? Because their parents are afraid they're going to get kidnapped or they're going to get shot. We live in this fear-based world. Self-defeating thought patterns, I'm not good enough. Social media, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. We need to tell ourselves, I am good enough. I am perfect. And I don't mean perfect, we all have human foibles. 
but we were put on this earth as perfect human beings. And yep, we stumble, but that's okay. We're all different. We're all at a different place in life. Be thankful. Be thankful. Every time we're afraid, every time we, uh, you know, say we're not good enough, we're evoking the stress response. Every time. Every time. Stop watching the news. News is fear-based. And there's a reason for that. Remember when we went back to the sort of the uh, psychologic freedom and I said negative things stick like Velcro? That's why the news is negative. Because that's what we remember. That's what we remember. So let me give you an example of that. The American Psych Psychologic Association does a poll every year. They've been doing it for 13 years, 3,700 people, all generations. And they ask people in society what, gives you the, what causes you the most stress. This year's results just came out a month ago, or last year's. Number three, politics. Well, you can do something about that. You can just shut it out. Number two, health care costs. Very legitimate for lots of people. Number one, anybody want to guess what number one was? I got five bucks for anybody who guesses this. Taxes. Taxes? No. Good try, though. I didn't do this last time. Five bucks. Okay. Num no. I was, I mean, I was, it would absolutely not even be on my radar. The number one fear, 71% of people said they're most fearful of getting shot, shot in a mass shooting. No kidding. That's crazy. No kidding. I would have never thought that. Neither would I. When you look at the facts, the statistics, 210 people were killed in mass shootings in 2019. 330 died in cars in Iowa. You're more likely to die getting in your car than you are going to the mall. But why is that? Why are people so fearful of that? Because it's played on the news over and over and over. At our expense. Yeah. And we not only play the event over, but then we put it in front of people because of the fifth anniversary or the tenth anniversary. And we just see it. And we think every day people are gunned down by the dozens. Yeah. Crazy. It's a warped perspective. There's a book called Factfulness, and it's written by a guy named Hans Rosling. And he's an epidemiologist from Sweden. And he wrote this book because he wanted to highlight the fact that we in our society are so out of touch with the reality of the world. And he asks questions like, what percent of women in the world achieve a ninth grade education? And he gives answers, 20, 40, or 80 percent. Most popular answer was 20 percent. Well, that was true 50 years ago. Today, it's 80 percent. Our world is much, much better than you would find on the news. There are extraordinary things happening in our world. We are safer than we've ever been. We are safer from terrorist attacks. We're safer from natural disasters. So that was another question. Are more people killed in natural disasters now than they were 40 years ago? And the answer isn't even close. We have better warning systems, better evacuation systems. Very much fewer people killed in natural disasters. Yet if you watch the news, we're going to die tomorrow and we're going to have an earthquake or something. Yeah, turn off the news. Turn off the news. Meditate for that 20 minutes. Do something mindful, not mindless. So we've talked about this fear, we've talked about stress, but I've got to give you the antidote, and the antidote is called the relaxation response. So we can evoke the stress response by all the ways we talked about, but we can also evoke the relaxation response, and that's what we did at the beginning with deep breathing and the crystal bowls. We relaxed you. We put you in a state where instead of bathing your cells in epinephrine and cortisol, which cause disease, we bathed your cells in serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine, which cause a state of well-being. So the choice is yours. The choice is yours. You can convert experience into biochemistry any way you want. How about that? Relaxation response is the common final pathway for mind-body therapies. So there's two steps to elicit that response. Number one is repetition 
of a word, a sound, a prayer, a phrase, breathing, repetitive, deep breathing. That's repetition. The second part of repetition, the other definition of the word is you have to <coughs> practice it. This doesn't come if you do it once in the blue moon, however long that is. Daily practice. And you know what? You can do breathing exercises that take two minutes, do it twice a day, and that can have profound effects on your health. Just breathing. We don't breathe very well. We use about a third of our lung capacity because we breathe like this. So we say, well, the normal breathing rate is 12 to 16 times per minute. It should be about six per minute. Six per minute. Our normals are way off. And then the second thing is, when we do these meditative exercises, breathing, what we'll call autogenics, all kinds of things, we're going to get negative thoughts. We're going to get all kinds of thoughts. And we tend to, and this is why people can't sleep, because they get thoughts all night long and they ruminate on them and they respond to them. So when we're learning about re eliciting the relaxation response, one of the things we're teaching people is you're going to get thoughts. When I meditate, I get them all the time. I acknowledge the thought, I thank the thought, and I let it go. I don't judge it, I don't react to it, it's gone. Thoughts come, thoughts go, they evaporate. They're just thoughts. They're just thoughts. But it takes practice to learn to do that. Because we always want to respond to that. Oh, I've got to remember that so you can jump up and write it down on a piece of paper. No, that time is yours to be at peace and silence and somewhere else. So that's what it takes to elicit that response. Benefits, muscle relaxation, quieter mind, decrease in negative emotions, increase in positive emotions, and enhancement of creativity. Multiple studies have shown that uh, the relaxation response can affect gene expression. Aha! We are now translating that experience into biology again by altering how our genes are expressed. So we can either express genes that lead to disease or we can express genes that lead to wellness through mind-body interactions. The mind and body are connected. No question about it. So if you go to a psychiatrist, if I went to a psychiatrist, you know what the first question I want my psychiatrist to ask me? How are your bowel movements? It seems wacky, doesn't it? But our gut is intimately associated with our brain. Yeah. Or the other way around. If I go to the GI doc and I'm constipated, what he ought to be asking me is, How's my state of mind? They never ask that question because we're not taught to connect the two. Not taught. So these are mind-body modalities, meditation, yoga. I'm not going to talk about yoga. Autogenics, biofeedback. We're going to talk about a few of these. Breathing, imagine that. So Andrew Weil, that's my mentor. That's who I did my integrative medicine fellowship with at the University of Arizona. Breathing is the bridge between mind and body, the connection between consciousness and unconsciousness, the movement of spirit and matter. It is the only thing we do that's both under our control and out of our control. So we will breathe. We can't hold our breath till we die. We will automatically breathe. Now that's not true for Tibetan monks who are like professional meditators. They can change their breathing pattern. They can change their heart rate. At will, they can even change their body temperature just through breathing and meditation. Yeah. So conscious breathing techniques can do the things we talked about, lower pressure, lower heart rate, help with digestion. You've heard of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Our sympathetic is the fight or flight. Our parasympathetic is the rest and digest. You don't digest food very well when you're under stress. Why? We talked about it. When you're under stress, blood is shunted from your gut to more important parts of your body, your heart, your brain, and your muscles. So if we have digestive issues, it's really important that we try and get people to relax and engage that parasympathetic nervous system before eating. We digest our food, absorb our nutrients much, much better. We can do all of this. And the cool thing is there's no side effects and it's free. You can breathe many different ways. Breath in, one, two, three, four, breath out. 
Um, what I recommend is your breath in is half the breath out. So you, if you're doing four counts in, you want to do eight counts out. There's another thing that comes out of the Eastern yoga tradition called four, seven, eight breathing. And this is what I do sometimes if I'm sitting somewhere like at a red light, I can turn a one minute red light into a five second red light. Four breaths in through your nose, not four breaths, four counts, and you can count as slow or fast as you want. Hold that breath for seven counts, out through your mouth for eight. Practice it twice a day. Do four repetitions twice a day, every day, and you can really begin to use it in any situation where you feel stressed or anxious. And all of a sudden, your body responds like that. But it takes practice. It takes practice. Just breathe. Meditation, the cultivation of basic human qualities such as a more stable and clear mind, emotional balance, a sense of caring, mindfulness, love, and compassion. Wow, we should all meditate. We should teach Congress how to meditate. <laughs> right? What's that? Yeah, I mean, you think of how, how we operate. We operate with anger and fear of the unknown. What meditation really does, it brings us to the present moment. So think of how most of us live life. We live life in the past. Oh, I wish of, could have, should have. Well, you can't change the past, so why are you even worrying about it? We live life in the future. Have to, need to, maybe. Well, we can't control the future, so most of us miss the present because we're worried about those two things. If we live in the present moment, life becomes this immensely interesting thing. When you notice, when you perceive, you're here and now. But most of us are off somewhere else. We're on our phones. We're worried about something, and we miss the present moment. That's what meditation helps bring us. Um, you can do loving kindness meditation, so we call it meta meditation, and it's where you sit and meditate and you repeat phrases like, I am at peace, I am calm, I am free from pain and suffering, I am loved. When you say those over and over and over, Guess what happens? That's how you feel. And so, in the in the in, in the um, world of healthcare, we're kind of in a crisis because we have what's you know this burnout. And one of the things we come to realize is, if healthcare workers don't take care of themselves, they can't take care of patients very well. And the analogy I like to use is think of an airplane. When we're doing the safety thing on the airplane, it says when the oxygen mask drop down, what are you supposed to do? Put it on yourself first and then help your kids. Well, it's the same thing in everybody's lives. If you are not in a state of well-being, loving kindness to yourself, do you think you can be loving and kind to other people? And that's not selfish, okay? People say, well, that's selfish. No, it's not selfish. Because once you get into that state, then you can give infinitely to other people. Yeah. I mean, think of guys like the Dalai Lama. He's constantly in this state of really love and kindness. And that's what he emanates throughout the world. He's probably never said a swear word in his life. I don't know. But that's what he's cultivated. So you can cultivate whatever you want. And again, what you put out in the universe is going to come back to you. It's really true. So what is meditation effective for? Everybody knows, well, what should I use it for? Use it to feel better. Use it to calm yourself. But it's good for chronic pain, anxiety, depression, general psychologic health. Loving kindness meditation has really been found to be quite profoundly helpful in PTSD. PTSD. And we have lots of people walking around with PTSD. 
So kids who have been in abusive uh, homes and things, they frankly have PTSD. And PTSD, there's a book, and I think Tim talked about it earlier, it's called uh, The Body Keeps the Score. And it's about how people who have had traumatic experiences manifest physiologic disease later in life. That that traumatic experience is now manifesting as a physical disease, dis-ease. Truly impactful. Uh, somatic health. People want to know, well, if I meditate, will I not get cancer or heart attack? We don't know the answer to that. There's never been longitudinal studies looking at that. But we do know that when you practice mind-body stress reduction or any type of meditation, we lower pro-inflammatory molecules that cause disease. And so by inference, yeah, we're probably helping prevent long-term chronic diseases since most chronic diseases that kill people in this country are inflammatory. Richie Davidson, he's a uh, neuroscientist up at the University of Wisconsin. He's actually really interesting because he has taken professional Buddhist meditators from Tibet and he's put them in MRI scanners. And they literally have anatomic changes in their brain. Their brains are different than ours. Their frontal cortex, which is our thinking, reasoning, executive functioning cortex is bigger. Their hippocampus, which is our memory cortex, is bigger. And their amygdala, which is their fear and emotional reaction center is smaller. And then they've done functional MRIs. So they put them in the MRI scanner and they look at what lights up in the brain. And when they put them in the scanner and they're meditating, their amygdala, which ours are overactive, most of ours in society, virtually don't light up. They even then scare them, put them in a fearful situation, and they barely light up because they've trained themselves to be calm and relaxed no matter what the situation. Now, if they were back in hunter-gatherer days, that might confer a survival disadvantage. But now, probably not. Probably not. Guided imagery. So when we did the bowls and did the relaxation, I, I asked you to use your visual sense to be somewhere like a beach or a mountain. That's guided imagery. It's really sort of a form of self directed daydreaming or hypnosis. We use this at the hospital. It really works well in preoperative and postoperative care. Um, so what we want people to do is we want them to visualize, and we have set programs where a voice walks them through with beautiful images, but we really want to take them to a state of some being somewhere else. And the more senses you engage, the better it works. So we want to engage their auditory, visual, touch, taste, smell, all sensations. So you're sitting in the forest, smelling the pine needles, feeling the leaves, whatever it is. And when you do that, it can reduce stress, anxiety, depression. It reduces post-operative pain. It reduces operative time. It reduces <coughs> operative blood loss. And it gets people out of the hospital faster. Yeah, it's cool stuff. And now we have virtual reality goggles. So you don't even have to use your brain. You just use the goggles, and it takes you somewhere else. Autogenics, basically it's another relaxation te technique and there's this script. You, so you lay or sit comfortably and say, my right arm is warm and heavy. And you repeat that three times. And guess what? All of a sudden your right arm is warm and heavy. And you just do that and you'd have this general relaxation throughout your body. <coughs> Autogenics. Biofeedback, so for some people, it's not enough just to do it. They want to know what's going on. So we hook them up to electronic meters and we say that what their heart rate's doing or we look at their EEG brain waves and see that their brain waves are going from a theta state to a delta state. Um, or we hook them up to skin temperature monitors and we see that their skin temperature is decreasing with relaxation. So for people who need objective data, biofeedback might work. Forest bathing. So forest bathing, otherwise known as Shinrin-yoku, was described by the Japanese in the 1980s. And it basically means taking in the forest atmosphere, taking in all the senses of the forest. And the idea is really simple. You walk slowly, contemplatively through a forest, observing everything about the forest, taking in all the senses, the visual senses, the tactile senses, the olfactory or smell senses, the auditory senses, and you do it very slowly. It's not a walk through the forest, it's just absorbing everything. So I did forest bathing, I took a group out of, oh, 
couple months ago now. And I had a whole route planned out. We we're going to go about a half a mile. We got 100 yards in an hour and a half. People really were intrigued. They were feeling the bark, hugging the trees, looking at the acorns, smelling the, the earth. And what the Japanese have shown is that by doing this, you reduce stress, improve your mood, lower your blood pressure, boost your immune system, increased energy levels, and improve sleep. All by absorbing what's in the forest. Now, it's a two-way street, though. In true forest bathing, you want to give back to the forest. And all you have to do is give gratitude for what the forest gives you. Gratitude is powerful. One of the most powerful ways to improve your life is to give gratitude every day for just simple things. Be grateful I got out of bed this morning. Be grateful I can breathe. Be grateful my leg doesn't hurt today. Whatever it is, gratitude is a powerful way to improve how you think and feel. But nature is incredibly healing, and we're learning more and more about this. There's been quite a bit written lately about kids in nature. And so our schools, our kids should be outside for three or four hours a day. They should be in nature, particularly trees. There's something about trees. We don't have an understanding of it yet. Trees are incredibly powerful, whether it's the oxygen that's excreted by the leaves. There's probably phytochemicals that are in the air that we just haven't characterized yet. But trees are incredibly healing. And it's kind of funny because I was thinking, there's a, I said to my wife, I said, you know, we're gone and in and out a lot. Maybe we should just move to an apartment or a condo. And so I looked at a place, and then I figured out, if I lived here, I wouldn't have my trees. Because I live in the woods, and I love my trees. So that makes that really fast. <laughs> trees. I love trees. In Sweden. Yep. Finland. So Finland, I don't know if anybody see, have, has anybody seen the movie um, Where Should We Invade Now? It's by Michael Moore. So you like Michael Moore, you don't like Michael Moore. I don't care for him particularly, but I watched this movie because I was interested in the title. And what he did is he went around different countries to look and see what customs they had that we should adopt. So he went to Finland, and he looked at their school system. Finnish kids are in school four hours a day. Yet statistically, they're, off, they're way better than we are. Four hours a day. The other three or four hours, they're out playing, in nature, doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we've got it all wrong in my opinion. Social relationships. So here we are back with my friend Stephen Cole. And Stephen Cole says, if you actually measure stress using the best available instruments, it can't hold a candle to social isolation as far as health is concerned. Social isolation is the best established, most robust social or psychological risk factor for disease out there. Nothing can compete. I don't know if I go that far, but it's sure important. Loneliness kills. People who are isolated, either objectively or subjectively. So you could be sitting in this room, but if you feel you have no social support and you feel isolated, that's just as powerful as if you were Ted Kaczynski sitting in the hills of Montana. No difference. And those people live, I average, four to nine years less. Socialization. Strong, loving, nurturing connections and relationship protect us from chronic disease. No question about it. Harvard. And I've got that on the next one. Harvard has done this study, the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It's been going on since 1938. They took 724 men. <coughs> sorry, there were no women in the study. Half of them were Harvard sophomores. We actually had one president who was the study. John F. Kennedy was part of that study. Things didn't work out quite as well as he wanted. But they followed him for their entire lives, and now they're following him several generations. And the question they wanted to answer, and they looked at everything, their social relationships, their medical history, their work history, their kids, everything about them. Because the question they wanted to answer is, what's the best predictor of longevity and health? So if I looked at someone at age 50, what's the best predictor they'll live to 80 with good physical and cognitive health? It wasn't cholesterol levels, wasn't how much sugar they ate, or how big they were, or whether they had diabetes. It was how good their social connections were. 
number one predictor. So how did they define a good social connection? They defined it as someone in your life who no matter what the circumstance, 24-7, 365, they'll come and do anything for you. Could be one person, could be 10 people. Could be a spouse, children, colleagues, church, friends, whatever. But socialization is so, so important. So have friends, and good friends. Texting on Facebook or going on Facebook is not socialization. Texting is not socialization. And my worry is that our generation coming up are not going to have good social skills. And I was just reading the other day, I was talking about which generation is the most sick in this country. Baby boomers, Generation X, millennials. It's millennials have more disease at their age than any other generation has ever had, and they have more debt to health care than any generation at their age. And we're trying to figure out why. Um, obesity is one problem. Environmental toxin exposure is another problem. But I think we're just, we're stuck with these electronic things and we're not really connecting as human beings with each other. There's only one way to connect with another human. And that's human to human. Electronic interfaces don't work. They work great for meetings. They're wonderful when you want to have a meeting and somebody's off, but that's not a social relationship. Bottom line, isolation kills. That's why they say the teenage suicide rate has gone up so drastically, because it's that this generation mm -hmm. that have used the electronic devices more than any other. Well, you know, you, we see it in medical students. They don't know how to interact with patients. They know how to do this, but they're struggling having an eye-to-eye -eye conversation, meaningful conversation with patients. And that's part of our problem as a medical system, because we've taken physicians out of the bedside and put them behind a computer. It's an enormous problem, in my opinion. When I do an integrative medicine consult, I don't have a computer near me. I spend an hour and a half talking to that person. And I don't even talk much, I just listen most of the time. Because I'm convinced if you listen well enough, the person will tell you exactly what's wrong with them. You just have to be smart enough to figure it out. James Dottie, this is a really fascinating story. So James Dottie uh, was a kid, and I don't even remember where he lived. But he had an alcoholic, abusive father who beat him. He had a depressed mother who rarely got out of bed. And he basically was living on his own. And he, so you got a kid who's living on his own with that parents, what's the chance he's going to amount to anything? Not much. But he met a woman called Ruth, and Ruth ran the local magic shop. And Ruth taught him all about this stuff we just talked about. And guess what James Dottie does nowadays? He's an academic neurosurgeon at Stanford and runs the Stanford Compassion Institute. Amazing story. He wrote a book, Into the Magic Shop. And he meditates on these 10 letters. Compassion, dignity, equanimity, forgiveness, gratitude, humility, integrity, justice, kindness, and love. How often do you hear those words used in today's world? Not very often. So if we believe in quantum physics, if we believe in entanglement theory, and we all went home and meditated or at least thought about these words every day, you think we could change the world? I think the answer is yes. There was actually a study done in 70, 74, I think. And what they did is 3,000 people meditated, and they were really you know, well-established long-term meditators. They all meditated for three weeks on the same thing, love and peace throughout the world. And before they meditated, they measured crime rate and terrorism rate. And they did the same thing after. And they tried to get rid of as many confounding variables as possible. And what they found is after that three weeks of meditation, crime went down by 16% and there was 74% less terrorist activity. Just think if millions of people every day could give gratitude for what they have in life or could give, forgive anybody who's transgressed them in their opinion. It, you know, when I look at that, I, I say, Forgiveness is really freeing because we all carry grudges 
Grudges are stress. Forgiveness. We're just human. We all make mistakes. Forgive. Love. Love everybody. Be kind. Remember, what you put out in the universe is going to come back to you. So think about that with every interaction you have, either with another human, a plant, an animal. I mean, we, we don't treat anything on this earth with respect anymore. And our earth is in trouble. We're in trouble. And it's not coincidence. So, so you all have the power to shape your lives however you want. I gave you the power. I took it away from the healthcare system and gave it back to you. So thanks for listening. I hope you learned something and have a wonderful life. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.